When you hear the word chivalry today, two things probably pop into your head. A man being chivalrous to a woman, holding the door open for her, paying for her dinner, or perhaps even placing his coat over a puddle as to make sure she doesn't get her feet wet. The second thing you might think of is a knight in shining armor, fighting a dragon, and saving a damsel in distress. Chivalry in the medieval era was quite a bit different to these modern conceptions. It was a code of ethics which included rules and expectations that knights at all times behaved in a certain manner. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of chivalry, let's go over some history. Chivalry started in France in the 12th century. Originally, the word referred to being like a knight. A knight was chivalrous in the same way that an artist is artistic. It was an immutable characteristic. By the way, if you're curious about the life of a knight in the medieval era, watch my older video here. But starting in the mid-12th century, the word started to mean the ideal characteristics of a knight. A knight was no longer chivalrous because of his horse and his lance. Instead, he was expected to present a certain set of virtues, like honor, honesty, and generosity. You see, knights really didn't have a good reputation before the introduction of the chivalric code. They were basically hired thugs who, while highly trained and heavily armed, had a penchant for violence and destruction. We don't know exactly why the conception of chivalry changed to include an ethical code, but it was probably, at least in part, due to the influence of the church. The clergy of the time insisted that a true knight was one who not only fought for and was loyal to their lord, but was a good Christian and a defender of the church as well. This idea especially caught on due to the Crusades. In the 14th century, a new literary genre was established, the Romance. Medieval romances were poems and songs that took inspiration from folklore and history to tell stories of adventure, forbidden romance, and knights in shining armor. Think, for example, of the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. These stories were extremely influential on knights of the time, who began to want to emulate the characters from the stories. While it is common to talk of a chivalric code, as though there was an agreed-upon list of rules all knights followed, no such code existed. If you look at a knight's armor, you won't see a pouch to hold a rule book or pamphlet on proper chivalric behavior. Chivalry was an informal thing, but it was taken very seriously by most knights. Common qualities seen as chivalrous that appeared more often than not were courage, military prowess, honesty, honor, loyalty, justice, good manners, and generosity. With the privilege of our modern viewpoint, we can break the rules of chivalry down into three main sections. Warrior chivalry, religious chivalry, and courtly love. A knight's first duty was to their lord. He was to fight in the military campaigns of said lord and do so effectively. Knights who showed cowardice by fleeing a battle were often stripped of their knighthood altogether. In Jean Foissart's Chronicles, in which the Hundred Years' War is covered in great detail, Foussard described a battle in which a group of French knights repeatedly charged a castle defended by English longbowmen. This tactic repeatedly failed, and many knights died. Foussard asserted that the French knew this tactic might fail, but it was seen as a more chivalrous approach than more subtle tactics. Knights were also expected to be good Christians, and to defend the church. Many of the rituals of knighthood, like the accolade where a squire was knighted by their monarch, involved many religious elements. 
The soon-to-be knight was meant to have a night of prayer before the ceremony, for instance. This religious element played a large part in the Crusades, in which the Pope in Rome requested that warriors across Europe go to retake the Holy Land from the Muslims, and thousands of knights joined the cause. Going on such a crusade was seen as one of the most chivalrous things a knight could do. Knights were also meant to act a certain way outside the battlefield. They were called to be honest and generous, especially to those less fortunate. They were meant to be well-mannered, understanding the etiquette and rituals of court, bowing to the right people, addressing royalty correctly, eating with the right tableware, that sort of thing. One of the most famous parts of chivalry was a knight's treatment of women. In the modern day, the term chivalry usually refers to a respectful and gentlemanly treatment of women. This was indeed a part of chivalry in the Middle Ages too, though perhaps not quite in the way we might think. Courtly love described a specific type of platonic, or at the very least non-sexual, love between a knight and a lady, who was usually unavailable, either by being already married or being of a higher social class. Think Lancelot and Guinevere from the Arthurian legends. Guinevere was already married to King Arthur, but Lancelot fell deeply in love with her. At first it was just pining, and Lancelot had no plans to act on his feelings. But once Guinevere returned his affections, they started a sordid love affair. Of course, in the ideal courtly love relationship, no affair would take place. It was seen to be beneficial for a young knight to have a lady to have his eye on. It would civilize him, and make him an even more effective knight, as he would try to impress her. Ladies would sometimes give knights objects, like a handkerchief, as a show of favor before the knight went off to battle. This was meant to encourage the knight to fight his best. As you can see, this sort of culture really only applied to high-class women. Also, there is less respect and more admiration. The knights put these women on a pedestal, one that was impossible to live up to. And I think that leads well into our next section. So far, we've only been discussing the ideals of chivalry. But as I mentioned, chivalry was an informal thing. Because of this vagueness, chivalry was not always followed in the way we might expect. And sometimes it simply wasn't followed at all. The truth is, historians have a difficult time separating which parts of chivalry were really followed and which were just fiction. You see, much of what we know of chivalry comes from those romances from the 14th century. How much of this was descriptive of the real chivalric code isn't easy to know. There are numerous examples of knights not acting in chivalrous ways. For instance, during the Fourth Crusade, a large band of knights decided to sack Constantinople, one of the largest Christian cities in the world at the time. This decision indirectly resulted in the Ottoman takeover of the city a few hundred years later. This instance is just one of many that seem counterintuitive to our perceptions of chivalry. And whether this and other instances are examples of knights falling short of their self-imposed ideals, or if many of the ideals were never taken seriously in the first place, is difficult to ascertain. Also, chivalry had more than one function in society. While it was a way of keeping brutish knights in line, it also had the secondary function of solidifying the separation between the upper classes and the lower classes. Only well-born men were able to become knights, and therefore only upper class men were taught chivalric ideals. This disparity continues to this day, where manners and etiquette are seen as upper class things. Some contemporary historians have a habit of seeing chivalry as either a poetic and literary invention that was never really followed by medieval knights, or as a chauvinistic elitist system that's only purpose was to solidify the power of the nobility. Both of these charges have some merit, of course, 
but I think they go too far. Many knights of the Middle Ages took the chivalric code very seriously, and while they might not always have lived up to it, it doesn't mean it wasn't real to them. Also, while chivalry was not perfect, it did have some positives. For one, chivalry really did bring knights in line. Before the 12th century, knights were feared by basically everybody. Monks in their monasteries and churches would often pray that the knights wouldn't raid their homes. So, while knights after the introduction of chivalry weren't perfect, they were certainly worse before. So that's chivalry, a complicated, misunderstood ethical code, followed by men who had enough money to buy armor, a sword, and a horse. Hopefully you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please leave the video a like, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, share the video, all that good stuff. Bye!